You don't get introductions like that more than once in a lifetime. So thank you, Glenn. I mean, that was incredible. I would have just soon stood over there for 20 minutes and let that continue. Um, <laughs> one, when one hears Jane Greer write something, and I've known her for a long time, so I, maybe I'm on to this, you got to always take it with a, I don't know, not a grain of salt, but a little bit of a jaundiced eye. So if she says, um, if you're into such and such and such and such, you must know James Matthew Wilson. I just can't help but think, well, if you're walking down the street and you have a pebble in your shoe, you can't help but know that you've got a pebble in your shoe. And then, so for better or for worse, I'm the pebble of the shoe of Catholic letters. So thank you. Thank you for turning up that I may irritate your feet for an hour. Um, I thought I'd read some poems and, uh, and then take questions and, and we'll talk for a while. Um, this is, this is quite an auditorium. I was impressed when I came in by how Catholic the audience was. We have, you know, the first row is empty, <laughs> which is great for my family because we're always running behind, but we always get the first view so the kids can see. And, um, and every, everybody else is like, yeah, go ahead and take it. We're afraid to be close to the priest. <laughs> you know, so, so thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that. So, all right. So, um, so as promised, uh, what I wanted to do was the following. Uh, oh my gosh, I mean, years ago, 2019 or so, a lifetime ago, um, we had a civilization back then. I, uh, I was almost done with a book called St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. And I was starting to look ahead down the road. I try not to repeat myself as a poet, even though my wife says to the contrary. Um, and I was trying to say, so what's, what's the next thing I want to explore in verse? And I had written a poem um, called Those Days of Weighted Solitude, which I was going to read to you tonight. I might have time to do it. Uh, but it's just about going to mass as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, sort of feeling the weight of, um, of this completely not at all understood call to holiness and what it might possibly entail. Um, and that was the beginning. I thought, okay, so I'm going to root into the memory, try to understand how we arrive at a vision of the good. And I thought that'll be the next project. Um, and I'm, and I'm just going to start doing the occasional poem for that as I finish the poem for Forbidden Birds, which at that point needed exactly three poems to be, that I had mapped out to be completed as a book. Well, then the pandemic hit. I don't know if you heard about this with the news. Um, people were wearing masks. It was weird. And, and that led to a number of things. Um, first of all, I had a whole lot more free time on my hands, so it was a lot of poems. But then second of all, I decided that uh, I wanted to report the news in blank verse. And so I started writing two poems a week to be published serially in, in the, on the website of the magazine Dappled Things. And the, the aim there was to give people in verse an account of what we were all experiencing in common um, in hopes that they would be able to, in some respect, interpret this experience in which we were all sharing. One of the, it's one of the most remarkable things about the year 2020. Americans never had more in common than they did that year at an empirical level, and yet they never felt more torn apart from one another. So I wanted to write about that and to capture it in a way that 50 years from now, people would be able to say that that was exactly how it felt. So I just started publishing this twice weekly sort of broadsheet news in blank verse uh, about the coronavirus. And so before I knew it, I had written this book, The Strangest Good, and finished it, as it turns out, three years before I got around to writing the final three poems of the Thomas and the Forbidden Birds, which I'll show you here, you're among the people on the planet to see this one. Um, 
because it's not officially published yet. Uh, why am I beginning with this long story about the details of the order in which an obscure poet managed to compose a handful of verses? Well, because you're going to be subject as punishment to the result of this whole experience I had. That's this. So I write a book during the quarantine period, 2020, and it's published the same year when people still aren't really having public events. And so I never felt as if I got to read the poems from The Strangers of the Good aloud in public enough, uh, often enough that I sort of got it out of my system. So I don't feel ready for the next book to come out yet because I still want to keep reciting the same hard poems over and over again. So I, I thought I would make you the, the unwilling victims of this proclivity of mine and would give you a reading from The Strangers of the Good tonight and take you through that book. But um, as Dr. Arbery mentioned, uh, I'll conclude tonight with a few poems from St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. And I would be, um, what's the word? Not remiss, just not sufficiently greedy if I failed to mention that all these books will be for sale later at the reception. <laughs> So, The Strangeness of the Good, a title that comes from one of the poems that I'm going to read to you tonight. And I want to begin with actually the first poem in the book, After the Ice Storm. And I'll just say by way of preface, of course you've had enough preface already, but by way of preface to this one poem, that in my view, especially the writing of lyric poetry, but really the writing of poetry in general, is always in the... Um, in the platonic sense, it's dialectical. There, you can never say the whole truth in a poem. You can only say part of truth. And sometimes the truth you have to say is not true at all, but it's rather a perception that people have of things. And of course, in our age, um, one of the dominant perceptions is of the barrenness of things, the emptiness of things, the mere, I sat in on your Dostoevsky class, uh, this afternoon and, and heard, um, who was it, Dimitri's thinking, what if we're just all a big nervous system, right? Everything just reducible to the body. Um, one of the things that will remind you of that is if you ever have a power outage that lasts more than a couple hours. Because it is amazing how even a town such as the village of Berlin, where I lived at the time of the writing of this poem, a suburb of Philadelphia, one of the great metropolitan regions of the United States, I guess, um, uh, I never noticed. I was busy raising my kids. But anyhow, um, it's amazing. It's you know a densely populated urban area, and it takes about 12 hours with the lights off for it to seem as if there had never been a person there. And it was just all as barren as the crags of the moon. After the ice storm, the tree limbs cracked, the stock car rocked, the village blacked out with the storm. The shape of houses shuttered, locked, weighed down the dark with darker form. We looked up at the boughs stripped bare months ago with the seasons turning, but clawing now the anguished air to plead some hopeless case of yearning. The wind whipped round us, and our faces burned with the dry burn of the ice in that most emptied out of places, unmapped, unmeasured, shorn of price. One night was all it took to give what men had built back to the earth, leaving it as no place to live or contemplate a second birth. We stood there, though, for what seemed long, the ice encasing everything. We listened to wind, Void of song, we felt cold's unintended sting. So there's a vision of the emptiness of things. Just to go back to that Dostoevsky class I sat in on earlier today, the, the joy that one of the um, characters takes in the prospect of everything being returned to nothing. It's not always joy, but it's always a possibility. Um, the, the great reduction of things to nothing in our age, of course, is the, what Eliot summarized so nicely 
100 years ago, well, 99 years ago, as this is the way the world ends, not with a bang but a whimper, is the great turn against natality that has beset our culture for really for 50 or more years, but that has become especially acute now when you have Japanese villages stationing dolls on their park benches because there are no children around. My uh, Cecilia, about whom you'll be hearing more later tonight, uh, Glenn mentioned my daughter, Olivia, who's 17 years old now. Cece is nine years old. Um, Cece loves ritual and routine. And one of the rituals and routines at one point was me reading the Pied Piper of Hamlin story in one of those gilded edged storybooks that are so wonderful for kids to have. And the story would end and she was illiterate. She didn't know how to read. So I took advantage of that. And I just kept the story going. <laughs> And all the children were gone. The parents were so sad, and they cried, and they cried, and they cried. And so this, I, I, probably the fourth time after I had done this to her in an act of clear state certifiable child abuse, I realized, oh, this, this is a poem. This is a poem that I'm going to write. Um, that first poem I, I read for you was in, in what's called long meter, all tetrameter, uh, tetrameter quatrains. This is in one of our oldest meters, Rhyme Royal. And my, my eyes are going bad in middle age, so I'm going to use a reading glasses here. This is a poem called The Children of Hamlin. Within the mountain that became their home, the children lifted up their cries in pleasure, their laughter bouncing golden, free to roam from wall to wall as they enjoyed each treasure. More was prepared for them than taste could measure from candy floss to rocking horses, all piled high about the glittering, echoing hall. They dueled with wooden swords and painted shields. They dined on berries, cream, and golden cake. While lounged on blankets, they called battlefields, unsure if they were dreaming or awake. But knowing every wish was theirs to take, and that the song descending with its trance possessed their tired limbs and made them dance. So great the harmony and clamorous din that filled up every moment of their day and made the weeks then seasons seem to spin, they could not hear those noises far away. As their abandoned parents knelt to pray, then, later, raised chapped fists up with a cry at the uncomprehending empty sky. The stony streets of Hamlin sank in quiet. The alleys emptied even of their rats. Where once plump clerks and merchants had run riot with sales of wine and wares, fine gowns and hats to please the daughters of aristocrats. Now only starving felines stretched in places that once were filled with flushed and cunning faces. The fountain's waters were shut off for good. The old men disappeared behind stone walls, while women, bent and sad, did what they could by stationing the square and park with dolls, whose arms forever spread to catch thrown balls, forever reached for some long-vanished treat, ears straining for the vanished sound of feet. The task in this book, with the idea of the strangeness of the good, was to explore something that I admit has been adequately articulated on bumper stickers. That is, you'll occasionally see the bumper sticker at the back, inevitably of some sort of RAV4, that just says, it's all good. And you just think, is it? <laughs> And what do you mean, it's all good? If you're stoned, it might feel all good. <laughs> but we've all seen The Matrix, and that's no justification of anything. It's one of the great lessons our Catholic faith and its philosophy and theology have to teach us, is that things can really only be all good if good is a property of being, not a sentiment carried in the breast of somebody who for the moment pretends to like you. And so the book as a whole explores the possibility of a world that's scoured of goodness, 
that's being robbed of goodness, as in the second poem I just read, but also a world that finally is baptized in goodness. I was asked to write for a magazine a poem about baptism, and I had way blown past the deadline, completely missed it. And I was standing in the shower one night with water running over my head and my eyes and my lips, and I thought, oh, I got it. And I raced and I wrote the poem in about five minutes and sent it off the magazine. And even though I had officially met the deadline, somehow it still got published. And it's a poem called Through the Water, which has an epigraph from one of my favorite poets, and I hope someday yours, Ivor Winters. This is a note that Winters wrote on one of his own poems called The Castle of Thorns. He must in some way cross or dive under the water, which is the most ancient symbol of the barrier between two worlds. This is a poem that starts with Augustine, but moves by way of Benedict XVI and many others through a vision of what it means to go through the water. Far back within the mansion of our thought, we glimpse a lintel with a door that's shut and through which all our lives would seem to lead, though we feel powerless to say towards what. It is the place where all the shapes we know give way to whispers and a gnawing gut. And so, in childhood, we will duck beneath the waterfall into a hidden cove. In summer, pass within a stand of pines cut off from those bright fields in which we rove, whose needles lay a softening bed of silence and great boughs tightly weave a sacred grove. When winter settles in, and our skies darken, we take a trampled path by pond and wood and find beneath an arch of slumbering thorn stray tufts of fur, a skull stripped of its hood. Then turn and look down through the thickening ice in wonder at the strangeness of the good. And Peter, Peter, falling through that plain where he had only cast his nets before and where behemoth stalked in darkest depths that sank and sank as if there were no floor. He cried out to the wind and felt a hand that clutched and bore his burden back to shore. We know that we must fall into such waters, must lose ourselves within their breathless power until we are raised up, hair drenched, eyes stinging, by one who says to us that from this hour we have passed through, we're dead but have returned, and are a new creation come to flower. So there's a sort of brief narrative of the journey of the strangeness of the good from the scoured world to the despairing world to the possibility of the rebaptism of things and their goodness. What I'd like to do now is to read a few of these poems from the Quarantine Notebook, which constitutes the, second, the, the third part, but in terms of length, the second half of this book. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, the world was shutting down in March of 2020. And I was just happened to be sitting in my office reading, and I thought, I want to write a line of pentameter. And then another one followed. And before I knew it, I had written the first poem of what eventually became the Quarantine Notebook. I didn't know what was going to happen, but Dappled Things had agreed to publish two a week. And so I just kept going until, or I, I said, I will just keep going until I feel like the poem's reached its close, which it did, uh, I think, May 17th of 2020. So only two months. I know you're thinking, this kind of went on a lot longer than that, yeah. But the first two months were something, and then something else happened, and that, more of that later. Uh, so let me share a few poems uh, with you from this. I mentioned CC earlier. Let's get CC back in the action. This is March 17th, 2020, which is St. Patrick's Day. And I'm only starting with this poem simply because it's going to be St. Patrick's Day. Terrific. Oh, and I have to ask, does anybody know the John Ford... John Wayne movie, The Quiet Man. Thanks be to God, okay? <laughs> I realized the other day, this is the second poem I've written that talks about The Quiet Man. <laughs> One that was written when Livia was a baby about our moving down to Greenville, North Carolina, talks about The Quiet Man, and here I am again. So get ready, all you loyal Fordites. 
I have to say, before I read this poem, there was a book published a few years ago called Jesus and John Wayne. And I thought, yes, my two favorite people. <laughs> it turned out it was like a muckraker's attack on evangelical Christians. And I thought, what a waste of that title. Some, one of you someday is going to write a book on Jesus and John Wayne. would just be like, Jesus, John Wayne, <laughs> for 200 pages, and everybody will love it. Okay, so I will buy the first copy. One of you aspiring authors out there, please, someday. March 17, 2020. Think back for just one second. I mean, you're all young, but you, you're, not, you're not amnesiacs, most of you. Um, just think back where you were on March 17, 2020, and see if, if you were paying attention to the news, if you catch a few things in this poem. We hear from news reports the young are out crowding the beaches, getting drunk as usual the brilliant images of sea and sand, which under normal circumstances draw the mind to thoughts of pleasures so removed from life, they seem a floating of pure body, now crackle with invisible contagion. A boy whose cheekbones are burned lobster red, his eyes crazed with the margarita sipped since dawn, brags loudly for the camera, he's going to get his money's worth or die. I go to tour the decimated stores to find among picked over wares some leavings and cart them home for breakfast. But I go mostly to marvel at the emptiness, to see myself what mania's wages look like. The clerks already have things half restocked. It is St. Patrick's Day. My wife has found enough corned beef and cabbage and potatoes to feed the seven of us evening come. When the kids woke this morning, Cece crept downstairs and found the living room a mess. A chair lay tipped, a shoe hung from a lamp. Yesterday's paper lay in wrinkled sections and mingled with a rift of stickered schoolwork. And there amidst it all, beneath the couch, she found the little green box she had made to trap a leprechaun. Yes, he's been here. It worked. He left a pot of golden candies, his messy tricks, the price we pay for magic. Well after dinner, when the plates are stacked, a smear of mashed potatoes and thin ribbons of beef, all that is left so we have feasted, I scrub the kitchen, sipping pints of stout. Then Cece asks to watch the quiet man. I've told her that a leprechaun is in it, which, should you see small Flynn, his pointed ears and plodding smile chomping on his pipe, you'd know is true enough, although it's not. The kids love every minute. From his bed, I hear James humming out its bouncy theme. Some young man on the news sings his odd tune later that night. He's cleared out all the stores for three states of their cleaning wipes and Lysol, their rubber gloves and soap and who knows what, all which he planned to sell online for gold. He almost brags about it, and I wonder how long it might take till he meets his fate in some strange accident that no one sees, save for a darting swirl of fairy lights that rise and on air and vanish in the gloom. And in the days that follow, Cece wakes before us all and sneaks downstairs in search of candy in her trap. She wants him back, her leprechaun, and cries to find him silent. Then tricks begin to overtake the house. My dresser drawers left open like a staircase, a glass of milk hid in a closet, toys that had been put away clumped on the rug. The leprechaun is tricking you, she says to have his golden presence back by cunning, though it's denied by times to punctual magic. Do you guys remember that guy? Price gouger. So one of the goals in writing this poem was that um, I mostly write in, I only write in verse, but mostly write in rhyme. And the first two thirds of this book, the first two sections of it are, there are a few blank verse poems, but most of them are all in rhyme, especially with short meters, because I love the sound of rhyme. But here I was writing in not Shakespeare's blank verse, but something a little deliberately more primitive. You know, I've told this story many times. Anybody who knows the history of poetry or of English poetry will tell you that um, 
one of the amazing developments that happened in the 16th and early 17th century was the way in which from Sir Philip Sidney up to Shakespeare, um, the pentameter became ever more supple and subtle and modulated. And so the great achievement in our prosody are, are say the, you know, the great soliloquies from Shakespeare's Hamlet or coming out of that, the, the tumbling verses of Milton's Paradise Lost, all of which are wonderful. But I wanted to write in a form where you could hear each line asserting itself so that among other reasons that when I was being interviewed on the radio, the announcer wouldn't say, so why did you decide to write this in free verse? You know, so stop myself from swearing on the air. I would just say, no, this is the verse that Shakespeare wrote. In fact, it's more disciplined than the verse that Shakespeare wrote. So um, less enjambment. Um, so depriving myself of enjambment, but also of, of rhyme, which is, you know, as I said, my normal medium to write in just iambic pentameter with a strong line, I thought the rhymes that I'm gonna to try to explore in this poem are what you'd call conceptual rhymes. The way in which private and public experience, public experience rhyme with each other so that, as I said at the outset, our experiences really are held in common uh, and are shared even when we feel so isolated from one another. So here we have March 25th, 2020. And I've got to ask, uh, before I start, I presume you all read Sir Gawain? Okay. And I suppose in your senior seminar after Dostoevsky, you read Five Children in It? Yeah, but you've read Five Children in It. That's all that matters. Okay, good. <laughs> this is for you, I guess. <laughs> all right. March 25th, 2020. I thought that looking back upon this time, I'd view it as the winter without snow. Out for a walk the other day, I heard the steady roar of a snowblower running, its owner burning off the tank of gas he'd filled in late November when a trace of flurries made its feigning fall toward earth. We do not always read the hour rightly. The signs the times bear with them are obscured as if by gusting snow squalls in the headlights. And now, it's something else that falls. The virus is spreading through New York. A friend of mine, holed up in his apartment in Manhattan, sends photos out of cans of beans and franks, beef chili paired with bottles of cheap wine, and Gowan in a tattered paperback, all captioned with quotations from Defoe and laughter at the way he's been marooned. A decade back, I recollect we shared bottles of yellowtail at a reception and talked of Auden late into the night. We met the morning after, our heads pounding, just like Sir Gawain knelt in winter snow, who waited for the Green Knight's falling axe that, with one swoop, both spared and chastened him. The fearful flee that city like a flood the wealthy spilling out into the Hamptons where all the year-round residents who pour the drinks and scoop the ice cream through the summer are saying now, don't come, we cannot take you. They've covered up the welcome signs, would raise the bridges if they could. The hospitals are full, the groceries emptied far as Montauk. I was supposed to catch a New York train today myself, but that of course is canceled. And so I sat this morning on the couch and read my boys the opening of five children in it. Dear Panther and his sibling and her siblings have fled the pestilential streets of London where things are labeled with invisible signs, keep out or do not touch or go away. And every bit of fun gets one in trouble. They find themselves left at a country house, much like the Hamptons, if not quite so nice, its chief appeal a neighboring gra gravel pit. While digging to Australia one day, their errant spade turns up a Samiad who startles with his gruff voice, snail-like eyes, and furry little body snug in sand. They little know that he will grant them wishes, 
such useless guineas men stare at like sores, or giant wings that with which to beat the air and rob a farmer's plum trees of their fruit, as if avenging angels sent by God. James blasts his trumpet in the living room. The straining pip, pip, pip of reveille flies unobstructed through my office door. It is, oh yes, Annunciation Day. How little we expect the news we hear until it comes upon us, brilliant, blazing, commanding we not feel the fear we feel, and that we must unlearn all that we know, so as to see the hour with new eyes, and what is more, to trust somehow we will endure that fate whose stroke has yet to fall. Okay, so I mentioned earlier two things. The idea of an ontological goodness that goes all the way down to being and a sentimental one, which in this poem that I'm about to read is associated with the 19th century poet and critic Matthew Arnold, that man of sweetness and light and lamb chop sideburns. And for good measure, we're gonna have a little second appearance of Cecilia Ray Wilson. April 22nd, 2020. The dome of clouds above us rests in silence and silent rest the roads and parking lots. The surging rush of motors gone surrendering the emptiness to one low constant growl of wind that roves about like dogs turned feral. You join them, those who linger in the dim gray atmosphere and stand in tape marked squares with coats and gloves and masks upon the face. You wait to be admitted to the store. The eyes retired and blank look toward the clerk whose handset crackles with the next directive. The skin grows moist with breath beneath its wrappings. And once inside, you fill your cart with milk and bread and follow arrows on the floor to trudge the narrow aisles back and forth. A gray-haired woman and her escort brush against you and its instinct to recoil, to stare at one another half a moment, uncomprehending, not sure what to do. Your voice is muffled and expressions masked. You think, what are they carrying? in. You think contaminations on my sleeve and then think how ridiculous we are and turn off down the aisle with the tea cakes. Years ago, we already felt this loss of trust that leaves one staring at one's neighbor as either an indifference or a threat. And that was when we still could see their faces. Now we're like Cheshire cats, but in reverse our thoughts concealed by disappearing mouths. Each night a janitor from Chester rides, the two, sorry, rides two buses and a train on his commute within the crush of fellow passengers. He keeps a tube of sanitizer propped upon his lap as if a talisman and runs an antiseptic wipe across the seat each time the person next to him descends into the blind of city lights. And then at dawn, he does it all again, on edge and waiting to get home and shower. I've heard some people speak of empathy as if it were the sterling of all virtues and talk of reading novels as a way to build compassion, make the brutal kind, forgiving what we cannot understand as if the act of dramatizing pain were one with our desire to lessen it. A taste for literature can soften hearts such persons sometimes say, before they cast their eyes with cold disgust on anyone who does not share their generous convictions. I thank you for laughing. I thought of this the other night. While reading some pages from a book by Matthew Arnold, he claims indeed that culture raises up the soul above its petty class and interests, refines it of cliche and prejudice, enlightens it to see the truth of things and draws it from the mire toward perfection. He argues this with such exasperation at those buffoons who will not hear his meaning, those Philistines who snarl from 
crabbed kirk pulpits, barbarians who recline with drowsy eyelids in mannered silence through his speech and offer a brief and different quiet before they turn to tap a spoon against their hard-boiled egg. He must have felt his lamb chop whiskered jaw wear out at last sweet eloquence with rage to see his reason's light leave all unmoved. Barbarians will remain barbarians still, and Philistines still fumble with their hymn book while counting out their profits from the mill. Perhaps a gospel of mere empathy is not the panacea for divisions that fester in the street or voting booth, but run right through the shivered heart of man. Perhaps it's not the only sort we need. While sitting just this morning over eggs and bacon with the kids, I read aloud the eight Beatitudes. In fact, I read them twice because they're hard to understand. Because as well, being middle-aged, I know they don't exactly stick within the memory. So blessed are the clean of heart, I said, for they shall see their God. I was so moved. Compare our hearts as to the bathroom mirror, smudged up with fingerprints and splattered toothpaste. The clean heart is the mirror that is white, a mirror that reflects the face of God. And Cece looked at me and tugged my hand. Do you remember what the Queen of Hearts in Alice says, she asked. And I had not yet seen within her heart how she'd misheard before she rose up with pomp upon her chair, her plastic spoon in all commanding scepter to summon shuffling soldiers to her deck. Off with her head, she cried and cried again. Off with her head. And we looked up at her her eyes as bright as mirrors in the sun. It's so true. It's all true. <laughs> the queen of heart, the queen of hearts. How did I not know? <laughs> what an amazing person. Okay. I gotta wait for my eyes to clear here. But um, So... So this poem goes on for a really long time, um, and I can't share it all with you. But I want to share, in, in, a, in a later one uh, instance, it begins with me going to, the, going to the shed to get the trawl out and start in the garden for the year. And, um, and then at a, actually in an earlier poem, the April 1st poem, which you are missing and you're really missing out on because it's a poem that mentions three of the four Marx brothers. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> I'm only not reading tonight because I think uh, I think Glenn's heard it before, and I don't want to repeat myself. Um, uh, you know, and my in that poem, the April first poem that mentions the Marx Brothers, my my brother who was living in Santa Monica was one of the first people to have the coronavirus, or you know, the first billion, and um, and uh, and so he comes up in this poem where he's evidently been reading the quarantine notebook and is calling to figure out exactly what it is I do for a living that I'm just taking all this crap that is happening to everybody and putting it in blank verse and pretending that, that it's art. So <laughs> took about two months for that phone call. So May 14, 2020. My brother calls, the virus long since passed, and he back at his desk as if it never had knocked him out or shaken him within. Do you just write about whatever happens around your house or in the yard, he asks. I worked my shed into a poem last week, I say, so yeah, I guess. <laughs> Outside my window, the songbirds raise a fugue of rapid twitters and crows erupt with loud, shrill interjections. But deeper on the lower frequencies, I hear the hum of Digger and of Crane, a couple blocks away, their steady signal that all at once construction has resumed. The houses left unfinished, their garages like gaping mouths that bear the plywood darkness and lumber stacked before them like a tongue. To these, the crews return and take up hammers. This working up 
quotidian life to poems just seems absurd to him, who for his living will turn a dollar into something useful, produce a thing that someone else will buy. His way of life depends upon his seeing how value can be skimmed from what was worthless, or from crude stuff, some good that others want. Just writing down what was already there does not seem right. Of course, that misses what is actually occurring when one takes the settled details of the ordinary and sets them rhyming one against the other, or when one takes the plain prose of the hour, the news report, the anecdote, the thought that passes through the mind while one's out walking, the odd thing that one's daughter said at breakfast, and straightens it until it fits in meter and runs in coded columns down the page. It's no less striking than what came of Daphne, her body hardened into ancient wood, or to those sisters who took up their perch within the maze coiffeur made of her boughs, to sing each other's sorrows in the dusk. Like other business, this not only finds but enters in, refines and raises up until we see the mystery that was there, persisting yet transformed as something new. Von Hildebrand writes somewhere, what we call prosaic is man's talking of the normal and ruining it by mere routine until it seems mechanical or bureaucratic. The ads, the carpenter runs down a plank, transformed to whirling blades and smoking engines. The great bazaar where carpets hang for sale, reduced to rented office suites where clerks sit sighing with their fingers bent on keys. We know just what he means. As Percy said, the whole world sometimes seems deep sunk in sameness. In sameness carries on, of sameness dies. We yearn to be shocked out of what may kill us. But Livia claimed this morning that I said otherwise. Art affirms the ordinary, and yes, I probably have. For do we not turn back upon what's plain and most familiar, such things as we know well, yet do not see? and suddenly discover what they are? So Plato noticed that because we think, and thinking is an immaterial act, we must have souls, and since our souls cause motion, they are its origin and thus immortal. But he's not through. If our souls are immortal, they must, in their vast motions, have seen all, including that great pageant of the gods who circle far above us, savoring beauty, as it shines forth from that which truly is, the whole world ordered by their whirling thought. Just staring inward on those things we know, our vision passes through and lights upon what we would never otherwise have guessed. And that is just what happens when our prose is sounded for its measured syllables and forms itself to numbers we call verse. Some doubt that it is possible to find a God concealed within a homely man inclined to argue with himself in doorways, or that those seated at a dinner table could learn within the breaking of their bread all that there is to know of truth or grace. And so they go in search of strange sensations. They check the headlines for celebrities who've been tattooed, divorced, or wound up dead with something, some mysterious substance in their stomach. The virus numbers growing stale, they read about a slaughter in a hospital and tally up the children carted out or watch and wonder once and then again, a man gets shot and crumple on the pavement. Still anxious for some change, they even dream of death as a disease that will be cured by some new gadget we can wear or pill that hasn't been invented yet, but will. But turn away from this. Yes, turn away. Our immortality is here already. It comes in even through the open window that brings the rhythms of the daily round, that looks down on the children in the yard and sees their play with sticks and grass and toys build new worlds at the center of the old. And let us lift our vision far beyond to find between the oaks grown still at last the centering spire of St. Monica's which draws the eye up to its ringing height, which stands impassive to the fearful hour, and lends the wide, the sidearm 
of its iron cross as eerie to a preening red-tailed hawk. I have to share one quick note about that, that new world's at the center of the old. It was one of the most amazing things. Came out to the yard, or I was looking down at the, the yard one day from our bedroom window at the front yard, and I can see that Livia has been up to something. And I go down, and she has constructed a miniature village of clay caveman people at the center of the yard and has literally built a new world at the center of, of the yard, at the center of our old world. So that's the second to last of the quarantine notebook poems right there. There's just an epilogue that follows. And no sooner had I finished this poem and I thought finished this book and sent it off to Angelico Books to publish when the uh, riots erupted across the country. And it, it was weird. It was so weird to have just finished a book that was the most ridiculously up-to-date book that had ever been written in the history of the world. I mean, I might as well have just signed it. And then yesterday happened and I had breakfast and mailed you this. You know, I mean, it was so up-to-date. Suddenly it seemed like the whole world was a different world. That what ended in May of 2020 was something different in kind from what then descended in June of 2020, and from which, alas, we have not yet emerged. So I felt the need to end the book with a fourth section, the book is basically three sections, but a fourth section that just has one poem called When. When noisome crowds turn out to flood the beach and with their flesh despoil all in reach, when some boy burns his hand and squeals with pain only to touch it to the stove again, when waiting for a carousel at the park, you see pale tattooed bodies purple dark. When this drunk stranger brags with all his force about his past adulteries and divorce, will you look on it all, just as you should, and in that sordid wreckage find the good? When you turn over leaves upon the vine, where lantern flies cling gorging each veined line, when great winds shake the tree and cut the power, leaving you in the darkness of the hour. When in the nursing home, your mother dies, cut off from muttering prayers and useless cries. When every argument begets a roar and every careless thought erupts in war, will you maintain what was once understood, that even now the world as such is good? And when they hunt him through the soaking heat, to leave him crumpled on a bloody street. And when behind calm eyes, he seems to gloat and press his weight down on another's throat. And when you see them standing calmly there, indifferent as his last word dies in air. And when the glass is cracked, the streets aflame with no words spoken, but that burning name, will you stand as the Lord of all once stood and somehow say that things are very good. So I'm coming to the end here, but I wanted to share just a couple poems, maybe three poems from St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. Um, so as I said, this is a book that officially hasn't been published yet, uh, although that doesn't seem to stop the publisher from taking sales for it. But, um, uh, and, and this was the book that was supposed to be, that was supposed to be before this one, and it would have been except for what happened with the quarantine notebook. Um, and it marked a great turn in my life, which was, um, oh gosh, I'm going to be very base about this. So I had a sabbatical coming up, so I was going to get a break from teaching. And, um, and Villanova University, where I then taught, had just introduced two years earlier a parental leave, where if you had a child, you got a semester off. But I thought, you know, we had four kids. We were probably not likely to have another one. And then, you know, my wife surprised me. She said, I'm pregnant. And I replied, looks like James has taken a year off. So, um, <laughs> so that was in March of 2018. And, uh, and that moment was, was decisive in a few respects, including, you know, I've got my wonderful son, John Cassian now, who's five, um, who's ridiculously prodigious. Um, but... Uh, I wanted to make sure, at that time, I wanted to make sure I had at least one poem about all of my kids, but John's the only one who got a, got a poem about himself while he was still baking. Um, so 
here's a poem that, that's sort of the proem or the introduction to this whole book, St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds, to an unborn child. Storm clouds move in and darken all the house. The morning paper on the kitchen table dim where I have been reading some reporter's grouse at things already bad now growing grim. Most of the prodigies agree with him. I rise to light a lamp and hear the thunder and watch the first drops thudding on the lawn. Your mother joins me. Here we stand in wonder between the hour that marks your life's first dawn and that one still obscure we're counting on. This is a book about the, the prodigies and the way in which, um, I, I, I guess all my books are about this, about the way in which maintaining form, whether it's the aesthetic form or the verse form of the poem or the form of your life. And I don't know if you know the theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, but he has this wonderful line that to be a Christian is precisely a form. Marriage is a form. It shapes us. It contains us, but also allows us to radiate. In fact, specifically through containing, it gives us definition and character, um, which is the deepest urge of the human life. There's a wonderful line from um, T.S. Eliot, uh, early essay on, on the music hall performer Marie Lloyd, the only essay he ever wrote on popular culture. And he says, celebrating the working class and their love of the, the songs of Marie Lloyd in the music hall, he says, they, they still have shape. The middle class, he says, is sunk in protoplasm. And isn't that the nightmare of every person, to live a life that's basically a bit of slime? You know, not slimy in the sense of malfeasance, but slime is an undefined, characterless blobbiness. Um, nothing could be worse. <laughs> Remember that show that I got sick of pretty early, The Sopranos, where um, the young gangster has, is reading a book on how to write a screenplay, and he learns about the idea of a plot arc it's like, oh, everybody's life has a shape and stories. And he cries out to his girlfriend as they're listening to Bon Jovi, where's my ark? Where's my ark? You know, we want our lives to have shape. We, want, we don't want to be protoplasm. Um, and so to escape the word of the prodigies, one of the themes of this, this book is the way in which things take on form. So the second poem in the book is called Self-Possession. And it's about that relationship of external form and interior life, self-possession. This girl in he heels walks by a mirror and stops to sweep hair from her shoulder, then turns and goes as if it's clear her, fate is to be her own beholder. And that glass in the hall grows clearer with her approach and dimmed and older, deprived and emptied of the face whose visitation was its grace. With a firm setting of his jaw and straightened back, the youth may steel himself against the threat of awe to loose his flabby soul and peel away composure, lest some raw sensation rob him of what's real. Thus armed and solid he'd appear to her whose beauty wanders near. Others may call it all deceit, the buoyant body, air of grace, the mannered greeting, slow retreat of hands, the raised repose of face, those frail and viscous hearts that greet the world lie hidden in a case, losing what life they seek to gain, immured from all such honest pain. But heart, who wait in cloistral dark and strive to beat in measured tune, you lend the decent form its spark while it sustains you when you swoon gives to thought's flight its well-aimed arc, and writes what from sense fades too soon, so truth may not die in the ear, but suitably disguised appear. I think I'll end with the title poem from this book, St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds, and I've got to tell you a quick story about that. So, well, I can make it shorter. Okay, here's the short version. You usually read the Summa in the morning if I have a few minutes, and um, as you do. And uh, <laughs> it, get into the treatise on law, and there's the whole article on the Mosaic Law and the Forbidden Birds, where Thomas Aquinas goes through each bird and explains why, in Moses' theology, 
why in the Judaic law, each bird was banned from being consumed? Kosher law. And I just thought, Thomas Aquinas, you are truly the greatest of poets. <laughs> so I just copied, started copying down what he wrote, and then I put it in heroic couplets, and I built a poem around it. And that's how we get St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. Beyond the window, morning sparrows made their song as if the whole world's goodness paid its plenty out for them and them alone. The old saint heard their joy and squelched a moan as his, stiff, his legs, stiff and heavy still with sleep, arranged themselves beneath his cassock heap of belly. Where had he left off before? He asked his three amanuenses, more for their sake, sprightly fingers, sluggish minds, than his. One said, with the forbidden kinds of birds and what their figures signified, for Moses, who charged the eagle's flight with pride. Aquinas sat a moment, mind withdrawn from his mouth's taste of buttered loaves, the dawn without, the wish for more wood in the fire to clear the frost from stone, or to admire the cool, swift brilliance of all he said, as a swan plumes its white and well-turned head. He spoke. The long-beaked ibis feeds on snakes, to represent the man whom nothing slakes. Feasting upon dead bodies open gore, the vulture stands for all who thrive through war. When Noah let the raven out to fly, it never did return to signify such men whose souls are blackened by foul lust or who unkind won't pay back trust for trust. The plotting puffball ostrich is that which figures all those weighed down with growing rich and hearing God's call, plant their soiled head. Plovers like gossips on stray words are fed. And who, on seeing the gull, does not admire that its bright wings to heaven may aspire, and yet it wastes its hours adrift at sea, gorging on fishy sensuality. <laughs> the hoopoe builds its nest on heaps of dung, just, to dis just as despair's eyes view the world all wrong. He paused then at the thought of earthly sorrows, our sickly past, incarnadine tomorrows, the myriad things that whistle arcane truth to please old minds and to instruct raw youth and bore down on his broken knees to pray for such a world that had so much to say. Thank you. So you've been very patient and very kind, but uh, it was agreed that I would take questions if there were any. And you have to raise your hand high if you want me to see you, because my eyes are getting tired. I'm a middle-aged man. Oh, where's, where do you point at? Oh, there you are, right in the middle. <laughs> I remember, you're the guy sitting in front of me, okay. Okay, so in a sense, I hate that question. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> because I don't, you know, the, live, you know, life of, in poetry is, is about growing and coming to know the world through poetic form. And so if you're just repeating yourself um, and saying, no, oh, this is a James Wilson theme, I mean, James Matthew Wilson theme, sorry, I forgot the middle name, but um, <laughs> then, then you, you, know, you really begin to think, think, well, you don't even have to think something. Your wife looks at you and says, that again? You know, um, she, she reads all the poems when I first write them. And it's like, ah, I think you've done this before. Yeah, so, but, um, but there are some, some themes. And um, so I, you know, I've published four full-length books of poetry and then uh, one long poem. I think I have it here. Yeah. Uh, just a single poem, 
seven part poem called The River of the Immaculate Conception. So I think I can name um, uh, some of them, uh, the, some of the themes. So, so one of them is, is you know, I'm, I hate thinking about things in terms of generations. I mean, hate, hate, deeply hate it. But nonetheless, I'm, you know, I'm of the generation X generation where we spent so much time speaking sarcastically that as The Simpsons has it, somebody says, wait, are you serious or sarcastic? You say, I don't even know anymore. Um, so the ability, to, the first, my first book, Some Permanent Things, is about learning how to find your way into a tradition so you can overcome irony and actually build something, something good, um, especially having a family and decentering your life it, through your vocation as a father or, or other calls to, to holiness or semi-holiness or mere not screwing up all the time. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and there, there are a few poems about, you know, very Augustinian poet, so I <laughs> love St. Augustine. So there's a lot of lusty poems in that one, but I, I guess I wasn't quite done. So, so my next book, uh, uh, The Hanging God, was about the emptiness, the, and I bet you all read Pascal here, the, 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 the abyssal emptiness inside the soul and the way, I mean, Pascal's amazing. He says, there is nothing that has not been seen fit to fill that hole. And one, among the things he mentions is um, leeks and endives. And I'm just like, who are these existential vegetarians who are trying to... <laughs> so, but, <laughs> so, so that book was about how we fill that hole. So it has, uh, it has a sonnet sequence, Spencerian sonnet sequence called Wiped Out, which is so controversial that one of my students told me he ordered the book used. It came in the mail. He opened the book up, and the poem had been cut out carefully by a razor blade. Because uh, it's... I mean, it's, I mean, it's about a guy who falls in love with a stripper. So, you know, you can see where that's going to head. Um, but, and that, so that's a 14-part sonnet sequence. And then it's answered later in the book by another 14-part poem that you all know, The Stations of the Cross, one poem for each of the stations. And that book is about, in fact, it even has that epigraph I mentioned earlier from von Balthasar about seeking a form and the way in which really our lives are choices between two forms, um, the, you know, the disintegrative form or formlessness of lust and then the, the forming in holiness. And it's weird, you know, that book was published in 2018. Um, it's about just your everyday generic, you know, um, dive bar variety lust. But really in the background of it, I have to say, it was um, just this acute and painful sense um, that I have, and I think a lot of us have, that comes to us from Augustine, I suppose, that with the prevalence of abortion in our culture and then the rise of uh, homosexual marriage or the juridical approval of it, that it just shows that there's practically nothing human beings won't overturn in order to satiate their lusts. And so that was my way of exploring that human condition, the way in which we're willing to subordinate virtually everything to our desires, libido dominandi, as Augustine put it. Um, and so then there's the river of the Immaculate Conception, which um, was written for the church and not just as another book of poems. Um, and that's about the Catholic roots of American culture. And in fact, retells the whole history of Catholicism in, in the Americas um, and tries to help us rethink what it means to even live in a place. Um, I bet you all read a lot of Wendell Berry and I read a lot of Wendell Berry um, and, uh, or have read a lot of Wendell Berry anyhow. And one of the things that Barry almost gets, but not quite, I think it takes a Catholic sacramental imagination to understand, is that um, the places you live are valuable not because you conquered them, but because they're the stage where God's grace can act through you and transform you. It's not about what you do. It's about what's done to you. And so reinterpreting American history as God's action in the world and not, um, as Robert Frost puts it, you know, our sort of taking possession of the wilderness was the, the theme of that book. Um, and then there was The Strangest of the Good, which I think you've heard enough about. And then there was this final book. Um, sorry, uh, St. Thomas the Forbidden Birds. And that last poem I read really is a poem that stretches into everything. One of the things, you know, if you're a, a Generation X person as I am, 
that means you also had to live through the Clinton administration. And so what that means, and I know this is gonna be weird because you don't remember that he was even alive, but um, <laughs> he was once president of our country. And, and what it was like to live in the 90s was to say that everything was so squalid and trivial that nothing mattered. And Francis Fukuyama was sitting around getting rich, telling people that the end of history had arrived. And everybody was like, oh great, the end of history is here. So we can listen to Nirvana and drink, you know, and that's, that was it. Um, but, it, you know, it turns out, oops, well, this is a little premature. Uh, our entire world is now being defined by its antipathies. And, and good and evil are as present in every moment and every turn of every street corner now as they ever were in the whole history of the world. Um, this is an age mostly of villains, but that means also an age for heroes. And so all of the books have explored that, the possibility of, of, in a sense, somehow becoming heroic, which really means to be formed. That's all I got. Oh, yeah. So one of the delights for me as a has been to um, not just sit with the poems by myself in my living room, but to have the poet sort of buzzing around the poems and giving me a little bit of light about the Only a few really uh, are called to publish poems. Do you, would you recommend the writing of poetry to everyone in this room? Uh, if so, why not, why not? Yes, you would never be allowed to graduate from college without being able to write a good argumentative essay. If you can't write a sonnet so you can propose to your wife, then you are not literate. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Sorry, propose to your fiance, soon to be fiance. I always say propose to your wife, but I've been married so long, I forgot that there was a time when she wasn't my wife. <laughs> We're just born that way, it's been great. Um, yeah, I, you know, it, it, Sam, Sam Johnson says the fourth, the fourth part of grammar, the fourth part of literacy is prosody. Um, and I mean, you could take a minimalist interpretation of what he means, which is elocution, learning to place the stresses in the right place. That may be all he meant. Or he may have meant, as Dante meant, when he referred to Latin prosody as grammar, that this is what it takes to become literate. Um, yeah, I, most of us should not be published poets. And I never anticipated being a published poet. Um, uh, but all of us should want to be able to write a line of iambic pentameter just so that not all of our words just die in the ear, but actually live in the ear and can survive a bit longer. Uh, I think that's that's just a basic human responsibility. We, you know, everything we do, everything we do is in some way or another an attempt to participate in permanence and to participate in eternity. And it would be nice if we could do that with our language, uh, in addition to our having of children and, and everything else. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, poetry is a kind of line. So the first thing is that even if it's about my life, it's never about my life. I just make stuff up. And in fact, you know, I learned this early on. My, in the Some Permanent Things, there's a long sequence of poems. It's the first long poem I ever wrote called Four Verse Letters. And that was direct. Each letter was addressed to a member of my immediate family, you know, my, my brothers and my parents. And it, talk, it refers to all kinds of things that were from that life. And I just purposefully put things that were not true into it to remind myself that this is a work of art I'm making. It's not, it's not, it has no responsibility to history or to the truth that's, you know, that's actually happened. It's, a, it's about discovering a different kind of truth, um, not unrelated to that one, but the, the truth of essential forms. And so, uh, so from early on, I just uh, try to make things up. Um, even when I'm writing in what seems like an autobiographical mode, for me, the thing I'm making is, is the character in the poem 
uh, and the situation in the poem, it's, it has its own autonomy and integrity that has absolutely no responsibility to whatever details may have initially inspired it. Um, so that, that keeps things kind of separate. Um, but the other thing is just not to be an egomaniac and to recognize that, you know, you have to live a life and that life, the purpose of life is not just to find more material for your, your work. But believe me, that's a real temptation for writers. I started out as a fiction writer and a friend of mine who, who's gone on to be a very successful novelist, Dean Bacopoulos, was always, we'd be sitting at a red light and he'd see some guy in a cafe and he'd start making up a character sketch about him. And she was like, Dean, stop trying to turn everybody into a book. You know, like that's, that's that, but, but I, I must say that that, that has never been a uh, temptation for me in, in part, I, I don't mean to make this answer go on so long and boring, but um, in part, because for me, what's essential to the art is the chiming of syllables, is the making a meter. Um, that's what's most real for me. That's how I got interested in poetry in the first place was the making of sounds. And so everything else is subordinate to it in the world of art. And so it also tends not to interfere in everyday life, you know, aside from when I go to my wife, oh, sorry, I'm such a poet. No, I, never, I get hit in the head if I did that. There was a, there was a hand on there. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the process of you writing poems? When did the mood be inspired? How does that how does that work? So I can't say anything very illuminating except for this. As I said a minute ago, I started out as a fiction writer, and the one blessing of being a fiction writer, as Dr. Arbery can tell you is that you don't wake up in the morning saying, I wonder what I should write today. You wake up in the morning saying, oh, I've got to write chapter 20,000 of this book that I've had sketched out for years, and you know exactly what you have to do. And the good news about that as a fiction writer is you get, you get your coffee, you sit down, you write for two hours, then you get up and you become a normal person for the rest of the day. Whereas, and this is maybe going back to that question, okay, so here's maybe one little interference of poetry in my life. Whereas, uh, you know, even a pretty long poem, at least for a first draft, doesn't take very long to write. And so that means that you have to wake up every day waiting for something new, you know, to be worth writing about. And the problem with that, people say, I've got writer's block, I can't think of anything to write about. You don't have an idea for a poem when you have one idea for a poem. You only have an idea for a poem when you have two ideas for a poem two ideas that preferably have very little in common. And it's only the argument between those two things that actually generates a poem. So, you know, I, this is, I'm becoming an old horse, I've told this anecdote a couple of times, but you know, um, you know, for years, um, I walked around with the punchline, uh, she took him into custody. <laughs> and then we're driving to the Y one day, and I suddenly tell my wife a joke, ah, blah, 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 blah. And then the punchline, she took him into custody. And she said, why did you just tell me that joke? And I said, well, I've had the punchline for 15 years. I finally got the joke. <laughs> I instantly forgot the joke, but that doesn't matter. It's not the eternal stuff of poetry. Um, you know, the, um, works of art are very dialogical. I think that's one of the reasons that Plato was such a great poet. Um, they, they realize that, that it's, it's, not, it's not the sort of transcendent oneness of some vision, but rather that oneness put in contrast with something that's its antithesis. And so oftentimes you might have an idea for a poem, and then it sits there for years until it's some other thing. Um, so just to give you a quick example from the River of the Immaculate Conception, when Livia, who uh, Dr. Arbery mentioned earlier, was six months old, and I mean to the day, I had her up my shoulders. We were in Tucson visiting the mission of San Xavier del Bac. And the poet Dana Joya had just sent me an early draft of a poem he was then writing called The Angel with a Broken Wing, which was about a santo, a Spanish saint in a church. And so here we were in this mission church looking at santos. And I thought, and, and the historic plaque said, this is the northernmost um, mission of New Spain. And I thought, that's right. Catholicism entered America this way from south to north. But then, you know, the Puritans went east to west. 
And so American history has a kind of cruciform shape. And I thought, I want to write a poem about that. Nothing came until I was asked to come hear Frank LaRocca's Mass of the Americas, which was a mass that was composed for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And then as I heard the music of that mass being performed, after 15 years, I remembered that moment in San Xavier. I thought, now I can write this poem about America. And it was, one idea was not enough. There needed to be something in tension with it. And sometimes it's not hard to find the tension. You know, if you're writing about something really sloppy, and you say, but I'm going to put this into Sestarima, then it could just be the poetic form with its precision contrasting with the, the ugliness or the, the formlessness of things. You know, that kind of ironic relationship. That, you know, that's, that's one thing. But you just have to wait for that second thing. So no wonder there's multiple muses. Because there's one who gives you one idea, and there's another one who says, oh, yeah, but here's something totally unlike it that will finally make it possible to write a poem. So I spend a lot of my time just waiting for two ideas. Uh, I'd better go to the back. I've been ignoring everybody in the back. Thank you very much for your time. I just wanted to ask you, because when you look at poets from across the age, we see Milton was attempting something that wasn't done yet in Philip Ryan. We see Homer wanting to talk about the British trade. We see Shakespeare who wanted to make money. I was curious, <laughs> why do you write poems? For the money. I think I better stop. That was a good, that was a good thing. <laughs> um.